Welcome to On Our Watch, a podcast about coastal erosion and sustainability in Louisiana. My name is Marion Evans. I'm a filmmaker and a producer of the documentary On Our Watch, a feature-length film that examines Louisiana's coastal land loss crisis and the ways in which it impacts our communities, industries, and culture. The film's director, Jonathan Evans, and I are proud to produce this podcast series that will continue to explore issues facing the Louisiana coast through conversations with local residents, community leaders, and experts. In this episode, we're speaking with Seth Blitch. Seth is the Louisiana Director of Conservation for the Nature Conservancy, a global environmental nonprofit organization. And now, our interview with Seth Blitch. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Seth. Sure, my pleasure. So first I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about your journey into doing conservation work. Was this something that you always wanted to do? Uh, yeah, it kind of was. I, I mean, I had a feral childhood. You know, I grew up in Florida. Um, my dad was a cattle rancher. I was, that, so that was work. You know, I grew up slopping hay and, and molasses and fixing fence and things like that. And uh, I, I don't know if I loved the work as a child, but I loved being outside and I loved being with my dad. And, you know, we fished a lot, we camped, so I was just always outside. And so, you know, as I got into school and started to think about careers, it occurred to me that I would really want to do something that gave me the opportunity to be outside. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, it, it, I think it was just sort of conservation and ended up being a natural fit with sort of the passions that developed as I did. Right. And so you were the director of conservation for the Nature Conservancy here in Louisiana. So can you give me a little background on what the Nature Conservancy is and the type of work that you do within that role? Sure. So the Nature Conservancy is a not-for-profit organization uh, all about conservation, and we actually operate globally. We, we have projects in 72, 73 countries around the world, and we have staff in over 50 countries. Um, here in Louisiana, um, you know, we focus on the kinds of conservation questions and needs that the state has. Obviously not all of them, but many of them. And, and we try to do it around, I think, sort of the spirit and the actual function of connectivity. So, you know, uplands to wetlands to the coast, because all of those systems are connected in some way. It's a continuum of habitats, you know, not a discrete group of, of ecosystems. And, and so we have a freshwater uh, aims, largely in the Chafalai River Basin. Uh, we do a lot of work with um, reforestation in the lower Mississippi Valley. We do a lot of work around longleaf pine recovery, uh, the Mississippi River Basin itself, which obviously is bigger than, than Louisiana. But um, again, we work with uh, colleagues around the country uh, to look at, at you know, how the Mississippi functions and works, making room for the river, setting back levees in places to you know, reconnect all floodplains, and then how that, you know, how that matters to the coast in terms of the delivery of freshwater and sediment here in Louisiana, since it all comes here. Um, and then obviously we do coastal work too. You know, we've done a lot of um, oyster reef restoration. Um, and I, you know, I'd say a lot of our work both in the basin and the Mississippi um, that a lot of people identify as freshwater really is just as much about the coast. You know, for me, I, I think some of the best things that you can do for the coast aren't going to be on the coast ex exactly. Um, and so um, that's really general. But we do that, you know, and we do that with, with you know, we sort of take a systems approach. We look at ecosystems and, and again, connectivity, whether it's a migratory corridor or, or, you know, the flow of water and things like that. But it's still, it's meant to benefit, you know, the plants and animals that live there, both the ones that are resident there and then, then the ones that are there for part of the year, you know, through, through migration. And so um, we do that with partners. Uh, almost no conservation happens all by itself or through one organization. You know, it, it really does take... Um, lots of people who buy into an idea um, and for not-for-profit you know that means that you know if we're not writing grants and raising the money we're not doing conservation um, and, and you know we've been really successful at that you know we've I, we've done a lot of work that you know i think we're proud of we've been in the state for i think close to 30 years maybe just a little over 30 years now um, and you know in that time we've purchased around 300,000 acres um, that's available for conservation. Most of that is now public land. And then we own over, a little over 30,000 acres fee title right now. Um, and so, but you know, it's not just about buying land again. It, we do, uh, there's a lot of science that goes on, like a lot of our work in the Atchafalaya. 
uh, projects like the Oyster Project, which isn't you know the purchase of land, but it's still uh, it's still a pretty uh, solid act of conservation. Right. Yeah. Well, very nice. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the habitat restoration work that you all do with the different animals on the Louisiana coast. Sure. What, what are some of the the animals that you guys are working to protect? So. You know, I mentioned oysters, and we, we've done, right, you know, to date, we've put out about seven and a half miles of oyster reef restoration shoreline protection projects. And so, you know, I think when you say that, a lot of people think, oh, you're just restoring oysters or saving oysters. And yes, but oysters are a habitat. You know, oysters are unique in that they're both a habitat and a fishery. You know, it's not, they're not an either or. I mean, they're, they're managed strictly as a fishery in this state and in every state in the Gulf. But they're also a habitat, just like salt marsh or like mangroves or seagrass or other coastal habitats. And so they really matter as a habitat because, you know, historically oyster reefs have a vertical profile. And so they really act to abate wave energy. And so they were natural breakwaters and that protected not just Louisiana's coast, but coast wherever oysters occurred for millennia. And as those reefs were lost, a lot of that energy was expressed on the shoreline instead of those reefs. And so that kind of started to really, erosion is a natural process, right? Erosion, we live in an area of the Gulf that's fairly ephemeral. The coast changes all the time. It's changed shape and position since it's been a coast. Uh, and it will continue to do that. But the rate at which it happens has really been impacted by the way we've managed the coast or the way that we, our relationship to the coast really. And, and what we knew then and what we know now, you know. And so losing oysters for whatever reason, and there's lots of reasons, you know, some of it's been water quality, some of it's been water quantity, uh, some of it has been the fishery, but a lot of it really happened before there was even an oyster fishery where we were taking oysters, ended up making great roadbed material. And so we took oysters out uh, and, and used it to make a roadbed to haul out cypress from cypress swamps, for instance. And so. When we lost those height of those reefs, then we started to see a lot of coastal loss. Uh, and that was coupled with, you know, blocking off the Mississippi River. And so all the freshwater and sediment that used to rebuild and re-nourish the coast was lost. And so, you know, a lot of things occurred over just the course of like 100 years. And, and that's when we really started to see an increase in coastal loss and land loss, coupled with the, the climate change that we're all experiencing now globally. So all that is to say that when we do the oyster projects, Sure, it's for oysters, but because they're a habitat, there's a whole suite of shrimp and crabs and fish that use reefs as uh, like a structural refuge. Like when they're really small, they can actually, I did my master's work on blue crabs, and blue crabs love oyster reefs because they can get in when they're really small and really vulnerable to things like redfish and trout and other predators, other crabs even, and they can hide in there. It's a really good place for them to hide, and it's a place that they can still feed until they get large enough to defend themselves or to outrun prey. Uh, so there's all kinds of other other animals, shrimp, fish, crabs that that use reefs in that way, uh, and then the reefs again they protect the adjacent marshes, and so there's a whole suite of animals that use those marshes. You know, there's a there's a bunch of birds like rails, um, and other wading birds that you know you'll find on the shorelines of, of coastal marshes, coastal wetlands. Um, there are mammals in there, you know, raccoons. There's a whole suite of rodents that use marshes, coastal marshes, you know, almost exclusively. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, migratory species, birds in particular, that, you know, marshes make great stopovers for them, both in the spring and the fall, where they can stage. Um, and so all of those sort of fall into the suite of animals that I think can, can benefit from a lot of the conservation we work that we do, especially around oysters. Um, and so, um, Anyway, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, so the oyster reefs, they, they don't just help oysters. It's a, there's a lot of benefits to the communities and the habitat. Yeah, and, and you know, I think, you know, we're sort of fond of saying that they can increase resilience, right? And so, again, whether we're putting reefs in where they maybe didn't exist before, but the, we have the right kind of salinities to grow oysters, or they did exist and have been lost, Again, sometimes they're lost and they're, and they're gone completely. Sometimes just they're lost in, t in that the structural integrity and the height of the reef has, has been lost over time. And so we try to bring that back. And, um, but it does, it builds in resilience. And if you have a more resilient community, then you also have a community that's less vulnerable or that experiences less risk. 
And in a place like Louisiana, where we have seen an increase in both the frequency and intensity of, of, of storms, that matters. Um, you know, the reefs all by themselves aren't, they're not going to stop any of the storms, it's, but they, they can, you know, abate some of the damage that comes with it. Um, and so there are human communities that benefit from these oyster projects as well, you know. Um, in Calcasieu Lake, where we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years, um, LA-27 runs, you know, right along the, the western shore of that lake. And that is the hurricane evacuation route on the rest, west side of the lake, like for places like Holly Beach. Rutherford Beach and, and communities down there, Hackberry. Um, and so slowing down, and in some places I feel like we've almost stopped some of that erosion in that land, protects that infrastructure and, and ultimately you know, adds resilience to, to those communities or people that use that infrastructure. So that matters. Um, and then I'd say too that you know, when we can recover this habitat, because there are so many um, animals, shrimp, crabs, and fish that rely on the habitat, it can help increase production of those. And so we see a lot of recreational fisher folk actually using the reef to catch, you know, they'll catch redfish and trout and things like that that are there hunting other things. Um, and when the oysters themselves grow, start to grow on the reef, you know, they spawn eventually because they want to reproduce. And when they do, um, some of those larvae land back on the reef and, and continue to help maintain that reef over space and time and even grow it. Uh, but others, other larvae will float off to adjacent reefs that are actively fished, and that can actually help commercial production, you know, and that's a good thing too because that's, uh, that's you know, can be a measurable economic outcome to, to conservation. Right, so there's like a ripple effect from making the reef. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, we, we do it with all that in mind, you know. We know that depending on where and when we put something, there'll be varying degrees of success for all those things. But those are all metrics that we actually take into consideration when we do a project. It's not just about, oh, we got to recover oysters in this place. It's let's do it in a place where we feel like we're going to have long-term success. The oysters can maintain themselves over space and time. And then we're going to do some good to the adjacent shoreline and, and possibly, you know, commercial and recreational fisheries, as well as everything that depends on oysters as a habitat. Right. And I, you know, I think that, again, if you think about it in that way, your chances of success are better than just, we want to put it here because it, that's where we have space. You know, we have said no to places before where we didn't feel like we would have a good chance of success just because these are, you know, these projects are, they're not free, you know, right. and they take a lot of money uh, to get on the ground. And, and again, they take a lot of partners. And, and so really, you know, putting that kind of effort and, and resources into something, we really, to the degree possible, want to try to, you know, we can't guarantee success, but we certainly, there are definitely indicators of where we're going to be successful. So mm -hmm. we shoot for areas that we think we're going to have longer term success. And so, and, you know, we've learned a lot. I, you know, we've been doing it for over a decade now. and. You know, in that time, uh, you know, we have gotten better about where we cite things and about how, what the kind of structures we use and the distance from shoreline we put things, all that kind of stuff Yeah, um, that goes into it. So is the oyster reef restoration kind of the main focus as far as habitat restoration in South Louisiana? Um, you know, we have some uh, preserves. You know, we have a preserve on Grand Isle. Uh, it's a critically important preserve in terms of migratory birds, especially for neotropical migrants. Um, Grand Isle is birds that take the Mississippi River Flyway, which in North America is the, there are several flyways for mi migrating birds from the tropics to, to North America, but that's the one that's the most used probably. Um, actually, there's no probably about it. It is the most used and there's 300, almost 350 species or so that, that, of birds that use that migratory pathway. Um, a lot of those birds in the spring after they've spent a lovely winter in the tropics, will will usually glom up on the Yucatan Peninsula and make that flight, you know, without stopping. Um, they'll burn up almost 30% of their body weight. And for a bird that is just itty bitty, that's you know smaller than a reserve, <laughs> you know, that's a lot. And so Grand Isle is one of the places that, that they first encounter. Um, and the preserve that, that Nature Conservancy manages still has a lot of uh, large oak trees on it, and hackberries and mulberry and things like that. And so if the winds aren't favorable, it's a great place for them to fall out and rest. And so they can, they can rest and recover after a really exhausting flight across the Gulf. Um, because there are lots of trees there, they harbor tons of insects. I mentioned the, the mulberries. Uh, they usually fruit, you know, their timing is 
set up to you know coincide with with migration. So a lot of birds like tanagers and, and grosbeaks that really like fruit just go nuts, you know. And so that gives them a chance to refuel because most of these birds won't nest on Grand Isle; they'll keep going and nest in other parts of North America, you know, or, and on up into Canada. Um, and so and so, but also after Ida, we noticed that a lot of the damage right around our preserve was it was bad everywhere but it was probably not as bad there. And a lot of it's because we still have big trees on the island. And you know the whole island wasn't forested, but it was much more forested than it is currently. And again, there's just, they act as, uh, they build in resilience. They, they block some of that wind and keep debris from hitting things. And so um, kind of like, and they do it for free, right? I mean, they've been there for hundreds of years, many of these oaks, and just kind of like the oysters we were talking about, you know, once they get established on these reefs, they filter water you know, and improve water quality and protect the shoreline. And there is no, there's a lot of, you know, resources that go into getting it there. But once they're there, they're, it's free. That's what they do. And so, you know, that's sort of the beauty of, of conservation sometimes is, you know, the restoration and, and creation of habitats and maintenance of habitats is just giving habitats a chance to do what they've always done. You know, those kinds of services that they provide, you know, they don't do it for us. We think about it that way often, but they do it because that's what they do. And, and there is a massive derived benefit from letting ecosystems be ecosystems. And so those are two examples. Yeah. So you can really create like a lasting impact just by creating a preserve that will last for a long time. We, we can, you know, um, we have the Chapalai River Preserve, which isn't right on the coast, but it's, you know, it's south of I-10. Um, and, you know, we own uh, close to 10,000 acres in the basin, about 5,400 acres is inside of the levees. Um, and, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of doing some work there where we're going to improve hydrology in the way that water flows across our property. We're working with Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority on it. But that will help in the delivery of freshwater and sediment through that system, but also ultimately to the coast. And you know, right now the only place that's naturally building land in Louisiana is the mouth of the of the Chafalaya River and the Wax Lake Outlet, which is another, you know, it's also influenced heavily by what the, the Chafalaya is doing. And so, you know, the more we can, again, improve and restore the way that system functions as a system, the more it really benefits the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it can serve as an example for other landowners, both in the basin or anywhere, to, to, to look at really fairly easy things that they can do with their property um, that can actually help the property itself but also have really measurable and lasting benefits for the coast. Right. So tell me a little bit more about the water quality efforts you're doing in the Atchafalaya River Basin and why is that particular area so important? So the Atchafalaya is um, it's important because it's the it takes about 30 percent of the flow and about 50% of the sediment load of the Mississippi River. It would be the Mississippi River were it not for the old river control structure. That's where the river wants to be. Um, you know, rivers, to me, I always think of rivers as snake tongues. They just move on their own back and forth and until and they're constrained, which we've done with the Mississippi from, you know, pretty much it's, you know, for Southern Illinois all the way to the coast. Um, and that's, you know, there are real benefits, commercial benefits for that and the flood control benefits and things like that to, to people and, and human communities. But there are also, you know, there's trade-offs to, to hemming in a river that needs and wants to move. And, and some of that has been the delivery of fresh water and sediment. Um, in the basin itself, you know, the, the Chafalaya River is not levied. It's actually, it's a, a large portion of the basin is levied. And so the Army Corps is able to flood that basin when, when the Mississippi gets high. And it represents an enormous amount of storage, which takes a lot of flood risk away from places like Baton Rouge, where we're sitting now, or, or you know, New Orleans. And, and so it's a heavily managed system. And then within the basin itself, there has been a lot of hydrologic alterations around energy exploration um, and transportation and other things, you know, again, human enterprise and endeavor. And those have had, you know, some positive economic impacts, but the, the, they've had some real eco, ecologic and, uh, and environmental costs. And so one of those is that water in a lot of places in the basin doesn't flow from north to south like it should. It either doesn't flow well at all or sometimes it almost flows in reverse. Because when a lot of, of new canals were dredged or existing waterways were dredged, that sediment was sidecast and it was just built up and, 
and um, on top of existing natural levees or they made levees. And so a lot of times what that does is when the river floods, it can't flood these areas that normally used to flood, or if it floods in, then it can't escape because it's hemmed in by levees. And that's really done things like um, setback growth of cypress, lots of new growth. Um, and, and a lot of the basin's been logged. Um, and so there's not, you know, you don't see as many huge, beautiful cypresses as, as you once did or could have. Um, but it also, in terms of water quality, it has reduced oxygen levels a lot in the water because the water doesn't move or move like it can. And so it gets stagnant and the oxygen gets depleted in it to, you know, we always hear about the dead zone and, and associate that with out in the Gulf of Mexico. There are actually areas of, within the basin that get t totally depleted for oxygen. And we've had people that crawfish harvest out there tell us that, you know, the area around where we own land, they were able to catch lots of crawfish at one time and don't anymore. And we think through some sort of modeling and both hindcasting and some forecasting that a lot of that is, you know, is, is directly related to just not having, you know, reliable oxygen in the water. All living things need it, whether they're in the water or in the air, they, they gotta have it. And so some of the work that we're going to do there is simply to notch some of the levees to allow, to restore some of the hydrology so that water will move from north to south across our property and on through the basin and then drain out again. And so there, there are periods on the land where the land is flooded, but then it dries out again. And so um, that can help a lot with, you know, keeping up oxygen levels. It also will let a lot of that forest community um, restore itself and grow. I mean, still, the Atchafalaya River Basin is the largest forested wetland in North America. It's a gem among natural features on this continent, and not many people know about it. Um, but it's, a, it's an amazing place. And so, you know, in terms of the work, it's simple to conceive of doing. Uh, we feel really good about it. Again, we've done a lot of, we've employed a lot of science um, so that we feel like, you know, we will get outcomes that are desirable, not just on our property, but throughout the basin. And like I said, set an example for others to, you know, take some of the risk out of it and some of the uncertainty. Uh, I think it matters, you know, for private landowners and public landowners. Um, and so um, anyway, that's soon to come. And I, I think we're going to see it work well and will, again, be a real example of, of really kind of something that's simple, not, um, you know, there's, st there's still there's still financial resources that have to make it happen, but if, but but it's some you know fairly simple engineering and actions that can really make a big difference. Right. It seems like it's a, achievable. I think it's totally achievable. Yeah. I mean, there have there have been similar projects in the basin like it, um, and and it's just you know it's sort of undoing some of the things that you know throughout the, the you know decades and centuries have have been done uh, that has sort of had the cumulative effect again to 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 sort of lessen the the environmental wealth of, of a place like the Atchafalaya. Yeah. What are the challenges to prioritizing all these different conservation projects and also keeping a positive outlook even when progress is difficult or slow? It, so, I mean, prioritizing conservation is for us often a function of just capacity, you know, and, and resources, sure. But a lot of times we really, we're in the middle of a visioning exercise actually right now that I'm leading. And, and, and by lead, we're all doing it together. So by leading, I'm just trying to ensure that it happens and, and that we're really doing this together. It really represents us as an organization. And, and, and you know, marries our skills with, with the needs of, of Louisiana. Um, and so um, you can't do everything. I have a tendency, it's not just a tendency, I have a habit of saying yes to, to almost everything. Because I, I, I think you know, the urgency of of conservation and restoration is, is, is really pretty acute. And, and plus I just love it. And so, you know, I really want to always say yes to things and, and um, but we can't do that. And so, you know, a lot of times we say, well, you know, what can we do with, with, the, with the expertise and capacity we have now? Um, we have, um, uh, occasionally we have the opportunity to actually increase our capacity. And so we, we can say yes to more things or do different things. Um, and I think that's important. I, you know, I think really always, you know, there are certain things we're definitely good at. I think we will always do. This will sort of be the bedrock of conservation in Louisiana. But there, there are always new opportunities for us. And, and I think we really have to be open to those too because you meet new people. It lets you think about things you've done differently. And so that, those things matter. Um, and I want to do a good job. You know, I really wanted to, 
do things that, and yeah, this word has gotten so overused, but that are, <laughs> that are durable, right? Um, that maintain themselves over space and time. Um, and that, you know, I, I, the story I always want to tell is it's so easy to talk about how things were better when you were younger, or when your, your parents or your grandparents were younger. We caught more fish, we shot more game, we saw more wildflowers, we saw more birds, whatever it is. There's, those stories are easy to tell. Everyone tells those stories now. And I guess part of sort of the calculus that goes on in the back of my head when I think about how do we choose is what's the opportunity that, that someone's gonna go, this place used to be a dump, you know, or, you know, or, or, you know we, we never saw so much wildlife or the water quality was never this good, you know, or whatever it was. And, and those are the stories, you know, I want future generations to tell. You know, when I came here with my parents, you know, we couldn't get in the water. We never caught fish, those kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of hard to plan for, but that's part of how I think about it. Um, you know, and, and in terms of, you know, being hopeful and keep your spirits up, I, I, I think I'm hopelessly optimistic, which is not to say naive, you know, I, I mean, but this is, I mean, since I've been born by almost every measure, the natural world is in worse shape. And I've been doing resource management in some capacity, natural resource management for 33 years, mostly around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that could be a pretty defeating thing to think about. Um, I feel good about a lot of the work that I've done, that the Nature Conservancy has done, that or other organizations that I have worked with or that we partner with do. I mean, I, the, the, the people in this field are here because they have a pretty serious commitment to to, and it's not just a commitment, but it's, I think a real visceral connection with the natural world. And, um, and really work very hard to, you know, not to have it for themselves, but so that we all can enjoy it. I mean, everybody, all of us are part of, not apart from the natural world. You know, we may not live that way, but that's an undeniable fact, I think. And so, um, you know, I know that when we do have successful conservation projects, whether it's the purchase of land or whether it's the work that we do in the Chafalaya or the oyster work that we do, or we plant, you know, 500,000 longleaf pines somewhere, that that's going to improve air and water for anyone that breathes it. Um, and so that's, I think it's easy to be hopeful that way. You know, I, I think in this field, you don't get a lot of wins over the arc of your career. Uh, and you see a lot of damage and you see a lot of things that get undone. Um, and so I think you have to, but, but uh, you know, when you are successful, you know, it feels really good. And I, I just think you have to look at, at, you know, you have to be clear about what it is you want to do. I think partnering still and communication in this field is, is essential. I, I, you know, we live in this world, so we know it and we work with other people like us. Um, but. Not everyone is, has the same association with the natural world. And it, I'm not, that's not to mean that it's worse or it's just different, you know, and so it's not to belittle it anyway. But I, th I think that there is a lot of sort of s separation, you know, from natural processes and things like that, that, oh, we, we actually need these places or that, that at some level we crave these places, you know, and it, it does us good. And so I, I think that, you know, one of the things I like about this job is actually the opportunity to take anyone, not just people that support the Nature Conservancy, but anyone out into a natural setting, whether it's where we work or whether it's where some of our partners work and just have a nice day outside. Um, it's, it seems almost a silly thing, but I don't think it's actually as common as it used to be for a lot of people. Um, and so all of those things for me, and I think for a lot of us, really help buoy our spirits. And like I said, when you have those wins, you're like, okay, I'm ready to dig in for 10 more years for another win. You know? Right. Yeah. Like every step you take, you're making some kind of difference and you kind of have to keep your eye on the ball. I, I am, Yeah. Yeah. I think so. You know, I, I, I think that um, there are a lot of pursuits that make differences in the world, that's for sure. You know, and this is one of them. Um, but again, I think for those of us that have really gravitated toward working with natural resources and conservation, um, you know, seeing species come back, you know, seeing water quality improve, seeing families together outside enjoying nature are really very gratifying, you know? Um, so yeah. And, yeah, and it makes it easy to be hopeful, even in the face of pretty rapid and sometimes scary change. Right. And lastly, I just wanted to ask, 
Are there any other upcoming initiatives or projects you have on your radar for next year that you're looking forward to? Actually, yes. Um, so we, um, through the U.S. Forest Service, have a grant to do some urban and community forestry work, which we are calling tree resilience, uh, as a play on resilience. Um, and um, the Forest Service, for sure, has lots of programs like this, both within Louisiana and all around the country. Um, this one is a response to the 2020 and 2021 hurricane seasons, which were pretty devastating for, for Louisiana, from all the way from New Orleans to Lake Charles. Um, and so this is really about recovery. It's about resilience, but it's really about trying to recover tree canopies that were lost in those events. Um, and we'll be working in 22 different parishes, or we'll be able to work in 20 different parishes that were declared as emergency areas by FEMA. Um, we've just hired someone, so we've added some capacity to actually run this program for us. Uh, they will start the first week of January, so I'm very excited about that. Um, and it, it, it's not just about planting trees, it's really about going in and understanding the needs of the communities first. You know, it's, uh, what I don't want to do is come in and say, hey, we're TNC, we're going to do some good things for you. And uh, what, you know, what I hope to do is, is really get to know people, know what their association is, with these green spaces or the lack thereof and you know what they really want out of having canopies. Uh, we may also actually do some work on trees that are you know sick and you know, so some um, and so some health care for trees and, and there might even be instances where we need to want to start nurseries both for the trees themselves or, or, or seeds um, or even there might be still some trees that present uh, a health and safety concern for infrastructure of people and, and it might even be taking some out will largely be planting trees but again this will let us work we don't we don't do a lot of work in this state with in cities in urban settings and um, this will really let us do that and i'm excited about that because there's no less of a need for nature in an urban setting now i would suggest there's even more of one um, and so um, this gives us a chance both to really you know get to know a lot of people get to know a lot of other organizations and partners and work with them and again, really learn about and hopefully be very responsive to needs of communities when it comes to trees and tree canopies. You know, uh, whether it's abating uh, heat on heat islands and things like that, uh, the aesthetics. Um, we'll also be working, you know, part of this is to work as much as possible in underserved communities. You know, um, and so, I, you know, again, I think that's good. That's usually where, obviously, you know, opportunity access is usually the lowest. And so if, if we can, you know, cut into that some and, again, be responsive to those communities in ways that they see their own needs and, and think about having shady spaces, you know, um, I think it'll be a success. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to me sure. today, Seth. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I know I enjoyed it. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for your time. Thank you for listening to On Our Watch. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Seth Blitch. Don't forget to subscribe to On Our Watch on your favorite podcast app to be notified about future episodes. You can also watch a video version of this podcast on YouTube, which you can find a link to in the description. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back with another episode next week. This podcast is made possible through grant funds from the Greater New Orleans Foundation and executive produced by Bruno U.K. Steiner. <laughs>